think we got the circle. I think this is much happier to the front. He doesn't say anything.
Please rise. We come together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have come together seeking comfort for troubled hearts and freedom from the wrath we deserve. What blessings are ours, even though we look at our lives and conduct and find sin and rebellion, in repentance comes the gifts of forgiveness and salvation secured by Jesus himself. Therefore, we confess our sins to our Heavenly Father, imploring him for the sake of his Son, Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I confess that I am a poor and miserable sinner. I have sinned in my thinking, speaking, and acting. I deserve your punishment now and eternally. In your boundless mercy, hear my sincere confession, and for the sake of your Son, giving himself over to suffering and death on my behalf, forgive me, be merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Do you believe that the forgiveness I speak is not my forgiveness, but God's? Yes. Let it be done for you as you believe. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray. Lord, on this night, we gave such, you gave such a blessed gift to the disciples and to us. Grant that we may so receive the sacred mystery of your body and blood, that the fruits of your redemption may continually be manifest in us. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading is from Exodus 24. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the just decrees. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel, who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in a big in basins, and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and seventy of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clean clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. Our epistle reading is from Hebrews 9. When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls and with the ashes of a heifer sanctifies, for the purification of the flesh. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purifying our conscience from death, 
from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised and the eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law has been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Our Holy Gospel for this evening is from Matthew 26. It's also the basis for the message this evening. Now, on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful, and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. These are the words of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We join in our sermon hymn.
life different for them and for us with the new covenant in Jesus' body and blood. Amen. Why is this night different from all other nights? This is the opening question asked by the youngest child during the celebration of the Passover meal in a Jewish home. Passover is a different night. During Passover, believers celebrate how God enacted. Scripture says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of, the, out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. God saved his people, but it wasn't easy. God sent Moses to lead them, but when the emissary of the Lord wasn't heard by Pharaoh, God sent plagues. But that didn't work, and, and he basically said, enough's enough. God would strike the firstborn of Egypt dead, from the firstborn in Pharaoh's palace to the firstborn of the cattle in the fields. But in faithful watching over his people, his believers, God told them that on a certain night, each Israelite family was to kill a lamb for their meal. They were to eat unleavened bread because they would be leaving in a hurry and wouldn't have time to let leavened bread rise. In addition, each Israelite household was to take the lamb's blood and paint it on the doorposts and the lintel, the top of the doorframe of their homes. Blood was poured, so salvation would come. When the angel of death passed through the land, he would see the blood on the believers' homes and pass over them, sparing the firstborn. And it came to pass. The people of Israel were free, free with a covenant, a promise. God said, I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. And from that time on, God's people observed the Passover, celebrating the Lord's goodness and mercy. So yes, this night is different from all other nights. It's a time of rejoicing in thanks and praise. Now, thousands of years after the first Passover and the Exodus, we find Jesus and the disciples gathered for the same meal of Passover. Is this night different from all the other nights for them? Well, for Jesus and the disciples, it started out like all the other Passovers. Unleavened bread, four cups of wine, bitter herbs, the shank bone of the Passover lamb, the carousel, and the egg. That's what graced the table as they gathered to remember and celebrate. But you know, Jesus, he also knew that events that were about to unfold for him, betrayal and arrest and beating and mocking and scourging, being nailed to a tree and suffering, and then death. Jesus even foretold. He said, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. He said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. You know, the next three days, they would be a physical train wreck for Jesus' life. And a physical and emotional disaster for his disciples. Jesus' followers would need help. They'd need hope. They'd need forgiveness. They need a new covenant of assurance to see them through. And so Jesus, he shifts the focus from the past to that moment by pointing to himself and saying, I am giving you a new covenant in what I'm about to do. Jesus then took bread, and after he blessed it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, and he said, take eat, this is my body. And then he took a cup. 
And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And in that act, Jesus gave a gift to feed their souls, to strengthen their sorrowing, their weak and wandering faith, and to provide freedom and forgiveness and the ability to walk again in his way. You know, at the time, the disciples may or may not have gotten the full significance in the moment of Jesus' words. Just as we sometimes forget, or we're not clear to the real significance, the impact in our communion celebrations. But you know, that doesn't change the blessing that Holy Communion is, and the power and blessing that it brings to us, thanks to our Savior Jesus. And so that night, God established a new covenant, a covenant signed and sealed and delivered in the blood of the Lamb, in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And that's the key. I will remember their sin no more. You know, whenever Jesus took the bread and broke it and passed it out, when he blessed the cup and handed it around, he was giving his disciples a sacred meal that would be shared in remembrance of him, at his command and in communion with him, until the day that they would share it with him in all fullness in heaven. The disciples were truly blessed that night with a gift that would see them through the unfolding events of Holy Week, and really throughout their lives and the ministries that they had served, thanks to Jesus. It was, for sure, a night different from all other nights for them. And that brings me to you. Here we are. 2,000 years have passed since that first Monday Thursday with the Lord. We're gathered here in this place to watch Jesus journey to the cross. We are preparing to celebrate Holy Communion on the night that Jesus instituted it. And I ask you, is this night different from all other nights for you? True, you're not a Jewish family. Passover is not one of your yearly observances, although it is an event that inspires how God works among his people to rescue and save. But this night, but is this night any different than any other for you? I have a little visual connect the dots for you to see before you answer. Our first one, it depicts what you would expect to find in 33 A.D. on Monday, Thursday, the dimly lit room, the disciples huddled around the low table, no chairs but reclining at the table. The second picture is the same Monday, Thursday depiction of Jesus and his disciples. This time, it's by Da Vinci. He painted it not in the framework and background of 33 A.D., but in a contemporary setting of his time, an Italian dining hall of the Renaissance. And the last two pictures are of a modern church altar with the communion ware ready for consecration. A communion rail, it has parishioners kneeling to be fed bread and wine. That is Jesus' body and blood. What do these pictures have in common? All show war-weary believers who fight against the devil, the world, and our own sinful nature. The fight that's all too real 
and draining and often overwhelming. People who have come admitting our sins in thought, word, and deed. Come knowing where we have fallen short of what God desires of his children. We come after the, the battles that are common but are also our own. Things like lying and cheating and stealing and laziness and doubt and giving in to fears and, and judging and putting ourselves over others and just living the ways of the world. We come because we know our times of failure. We come looking for relief and repentance and forgiveness. Then, as we do, we remember Jesus' suffering. We remember his wounds, his agony of pain, his patient and silent enduring of mockery, all for us. We remember our Lord rescuing us from sin and death and the power of the devil with his true body given and blood shed on a cross at Calvary, being given over to death with the result that the death we deserve punishment that should be ours because of our sins they are removed because Jesus has bore them all he it is all fulfilled in him our sins are covered over and removed thanks to Jesus along with any threats of eternal separation from him and the father and so we come like the people in the picture we come looking for the new covenant looking for help and hope and strength. And I tell you now, whether it was that early picture of Jesus on Monday, Thursday, or the one from the Renaissance, or the ones that show the modern altar and communion rail and people kneeling there, you've come to the right place because they're all connected. You see, every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we remember and we celebrate God working. Working with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm as he stretched out his arms and opened his mighty hands on a piece of wood, a cross, where he allowed man to drive nails into them so that the covenant would be fulfilled. That rescue would be given for all who would repent and believe. We share a meal. We share a meal with the same host that's present in all three of those pictures. The disciples are here. You're among them even now. We hear Jesus' words again. This is my body which is given for you. This is my blood which is shed for you. And in that meal is so much more than just remembering going on. When we eat and drink it, communion actually does something to us. In that eating and drinking, we are given the forgiveness of sins. So that was all accomplished at the cross. We're given new life. We're given strength of faith. We're given the strength to face all the trials and temptations that come our way. And we're given eternal salvation. And we're also given the promise and the assurance that Heaven is our home, even now. So you see, whether it's that first picture, or the second picture, or the other ones we've shown, is this night different from all other nights? Well, yes. Along with every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, because in it, our Lord comes right to us again. The new covenant the new promises, the blessings that are now set before you, served by our Lord himself for those to eat and to drink in faith. Those who trust his words, blessings do flow. So this night is definitely different from all other nights, thanks to Jesus. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds cling to Christ Jesus. Amen. And at this time, the offering will be brought forward.
Please rise for prayer. Father, as Jesus gathered his disciples in the upper room this night, we come to you in his name with the prayers on our hearts for ourselves and all people. We pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Holy Spirit, work in us that we would treasure the promises of God made to his people in the past and us today. We pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord, in a world where confusion and fear seem to get the upper hand way too often, people are seeking hope. Give your church one voice, proclaiming the confidence, peace, and direction found in Jesus Christ alone. Cover all our sins with the blood of Christ, and may the Spirit work in us a new spirit that walks in your will and ways. We pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Have mercy, Lord, and spare your people. As health concerns arise and when life draws to a close, be with the sick, comfort the fearful, grant to the dying and all the family and friends impacted in these times your courage and peace. Give healing according to your will and strength to bear in all things. We pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Heavenly Father, this night Jesus instituted his supper to eat and to drink, a blessing for our good. In this meal, Jesus promised the blessings of the forgiveness of sins, and where there is forgiveness, life, strength of faith, strength to fight off all trials and temptations, and the gift of eternal life flow. Have mercy on us and bless us with these gifts. We pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. You know, O oh Lord, what we need, and you have promised to hear our prayers and respond in your loving goodness. We lift up these prayers and all things that we should in Jesus' name, thanking you always. Amen. we prepare to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Hear Luther's admonition to the communicants. I exhort you in Christ that you give attention to the testament of Christ in true faith. And above all, take to heart the words with which Christ presents his body and blood to us for forgiveness. That you take note and give thanks for the boundless love that he showed us when he saved us from the wrath of God, sin, death, and hell by his blood. And that you then externally receive the bread and wine that is his body and blood as a guarantee and pledge. Let us then in his name, according to his command, and with his own words, administer and receive the testaments. <laughs>
bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as our choir sings the Lord's Prayer.
body of Christ. Take me, the true body of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for Take me, the true body of Christ. Take me, the true body of Christ.
holy and precious body and blood of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith to life everlasting. We depart in his peace. Amen. Please rise for our close communion prayer. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you've refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same and faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated at this time. We're going to have the stripping of the altar. Uh, before we used to, uh, I'm doing something a little different this year. Before we used to name each thing as it's being removed, instead, it's going to be mentioned at the beginning. And instead, we're going to uh, read responsibly in a larger portion uh, Psalm 22. And I didn't ask Julia if she's doing it, so I figured she would do that for us. I appreciate that. The altar is a symbol of our Lord. Vested in fine linens, holding the vessels for bread and wine, and the stand for readings from Scripture and for the liturgy, and have candles to proclaim Him as the light of the world. As those adornments are removed, symbolic of the abuse our Lord experienced today and tomorrow, we will read Psalm 22, for the evangelists Matthew and Mark tell us that our Lord prayed, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me as he took our place on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? For the words of my God, oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy. Enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you are fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, sworn by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make vows at me. They wag their heads. He trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you in my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth and from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravaging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot chair, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. I will be my help and come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him, and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel. 
for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him, from, your, from you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat to be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nation shall worship before you. For the kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. While all the prosperous of the earth eat and worship, before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who do not keep himself alive. Prosperity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generations. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to the people of the heavenly born. We leave the sanctuary in silence, praying, O Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Amen. And remember that this is only scene one. The story isn't over. Join us tomorrow for scene two, Good Friday, where we will sing uh, hymns and hear readings of the Passion account. Go in the Lord's peace.